Hello everyone, my name is Nagesa Dube. Uh, welcome to Uga Media. In our uh, today's program, we have a special guest, Ambassador David Shin. David Shin has been teaching in Elliott School of International Affairs at George Washington University since 2001. He previously served for 37 years uh, as a U.S. Foreign Service with assignments as, at embassies in Lebanon, Kenya, Tanzania, Mauritania, Cameroon, Sudan, and Burkina Faso. He served as ambassador to Ethiopia from 1996 to... Um, to 1999. He is the author of, author or co-author of four books, including the Historical Dictionary of Ethiopia and numerous books, chapters and journal articles. He has a PhD in political science from George Washington University. Ambassador Shin's insights into Ethiopian current affairs is, uh, are invaluable. Today, we have the privilege of exploring multifaceted world of international relations with Ambassador David Shin. So, uh, welcome Ambassador Shin. Thank you, uh, Anthony Um So, um, now let's dive into our questions. Question, uh, Ambassador Shin, can you offer insights into the legal and the geopolitical implication of the Ethiopian Somaliland MOU, particularly in light of Somaliland's lack of international recognition and uh, opposition from Somalia? Uh, besides, uh, what regional impact do you anticipate as a result? Well, there obviously have already been many regional impacts of that memorandum of understanding. Uh, it has introduced a, a very new and complicated element in Horn of African uh, issues. Uh, I think it is important for all of your listeners to understand that uh, I'm not aware that any of us have seen the full text of the MOU. I certainly have not. I've seen a lot of reporting on it. I've seen a great deal of discussion about it. Uh, but if the uh, text has been released publicly, uh, I've not seen it. So I think it's important to be a little careful in terms of what we say about it without knowing exactly what is in it. Uh, but we do know the broad outlines of what is in it, or at least what purportedly is in it. And it does introduce uh, some, some whole new issues for the Horn of Africa that have uh, clearly stirred matters up in the Horn, particularly uh, in terms of uh, Ethiopia-Somali relations, uh, which have, have taken a, um, a downward trend since the announcement of the MOU. Uh, there are issues, I think, that also are of great interest to Djibouti in terms of the economic implications of the, um, of the MOU, if it should be implemented in full. And uh, the Eritreans are clearly concerned about um, what the implications of it are. Uh, frankly, I think it's, it's going to take a long time to implement that agreement, assuming that it ever gets fully implemented. It's a question of um, Ethiopia following through with what it's set out to do, uh, whether Ethiopia fully agrees that this is the proper approach or not. Uh, and if it does agree that it's the right approach to pursue, the, the mechanics of uh, implementing this agreement are going to be very costly. Uh, that is the building of, of infrastructure uh, between um, mainly Jigjiga and uh, Hargeisa, and then from Hargeisa on down to Berbera, uh, not to mention the mechanics of uh, establishing a military base uh, somewhere in the Gulf of Aden uh, in, uh, in Somaliland. Uh, and presumably in order to support a new Ethiopian Navy, which it does not now have. So there are all kinds of uh, logistical and, and expense issues that need to be dealt with, uh, not to mention the whole issue of um, diplomatic recognition of Somali Somaliland as a country and what that uh, will uh, 
foretell for the rest of Africa and, and the rest of the world. So a lot of issues have been put on the table as a result of this MOU. Uh, do you think uh, it might cause, it might uh, incite conflict? Uh, do you expect a conflict can arise as a result of this? Well, it, it could. I mean, uh, Somalia has already, uh, that is the government in uh, Mogadishu, has already suggested that if the if the MOU is pursued, uh, as we think we understand it is written, uh, that would create a lot of uh, a lot of concern in Mogadishu. Uh, that could lead to some kind of conflict between Ethiopia and Somalia. Uh, the The economic implications are very different. Uh, again, it, as I say, it would take a long time to build up the infrastructure between Jigjiga and uh, Berbera before it would ever replace uh, the already good existing infrastructure between Djibouti and Addis Ababa. Uh, but if that were to happen, it would have major uh, economic implications for Djibouti and create concerns there. Uh, what, uh, what, other what it would do vis-a-vis -vis Eritrea is not certain. I suppose even conceivably it might diminish somewhat uh, concerns in Eritrea about what Ethiopia's intentions are. But yes, there there is the possibility that it could lead to conflict, but particularly with Somalia. Okay, uh, just uh, with this question, do you think uh, Somaliland benefited in terms of maybe acquiring international recognition, like if if Ethiopia, like, Basically, we know that Somaliland has been under British and Somalia. I mean, their colonial background is different. And also the fact that the last uh, 30 plus years, Somaliland has been, it has met all the requirements to be a state except, except lack of recognition. So do you think so Somaliland has benefited from this? Uh, this very uh, MOU? Well, Somaliland has certainly gotten a great deal of publicity uh, as a result of uh, the MOU, but so far that's really all that it has obtained. Uh, nothing tangible has yet taken place, as far as I know, that advances uh, the position of Somaliland. As, as you point out, uh, from a strictly legal point of view, uh, Somaliland can make a case for independence. Uh, it was independent for five days from uh, June 26, 1960 until July 1, 1960, when it joined uh, Somalia as the Somali Republic. So it does have a very brief history of, uh, of independence on its own, a legal uh, independence. So from a legal point of view, the Somaliland case is quite strong. Uh, the problem is that uh, the, the African Union has not uh, seen fit to determine uh, or to approve or, or to endorse an independent Somaliland. And as a result, no African country so far has uh, agreed to uh, recognize its independence. If Ethiopia were in fact to do so, which it has not yet done so, uh, it would be the first. And that could open the door for others. In fact, it might very well open the door for others. Um, but that, that's one of the big issues now. Does Ethiopia plan to do that or not? And I don't know the answer to that question. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, we'll, uh, we'll wait, wait and see if Ethiopia will do that or not. Uh, potentially, if Ethiopia does, do you think many other countries would follow? I think a, a few African countries might well follow. Um, I don't know as though the numbers would be, be very large. I think Somalia, the government of Somalia and Mogadishu is, has a lot of friends in, in Africa, and I think its friends would be reluctant uh, to recognize an independent Somaliland. Some of these countries have their own uh, breakaway movements, and, and they would be concerned that recognizing Somaliland would 
it would result in efforts in their own country to uh, to break away. So I think it would be a, a very mixed uh, response, uh, but probably a few countries would follow Ethiopian an Ethiopian lead on this. Okay, moving on. Uh, could you provide uh, your insights on uh, Representative uh, Ilhan Omar's recent comments about Theo Somaliland uh, MOU? Uh, how do you receive uh, their potential impact on diplomatic relations or public discourse? Yeah, uh, first, uh, the, the views of one of 435 members of the U.S. House of Representatives is not going to determine uh, what the U.S. position is vis-a-vis -vis Somalia or Somaliland. Our system just doesn't work that way. Uh, she has one voice, one vote, as it were, and that's an important voice because she is a Somali-American and she knows the situation very well. Part of the problem with the remarks that she made in Minneapolis uh, to a Somali-American audience is that she was speaking in Somali, uh, which is, is fine, uh, to a Somali audience. And to the best of my knowledge, there is not a, uh, an agreed upon uh, transcription into English as to what exactly she said. And I've seen different accounts of, the, uh, of her remarks that are not in total agreement. Uh, so in the first instance, it's important that we have the exact uh, agreed upon translation of what her remarks were. Uh, but assuming that that is available or becomes available, it's important to remember that it is the executive branch of the U.S. government, the, the White House, the State Department, that make a determination on what U.S. relations with Somalia and Somaliland will be. And the U.S. has uh, been very consistent that it supports a uh, unified Somalia, basically following the African Union position on this. So I don't see any change taking place as a result of uh, uh, Ilhan Omar's remarks. Uh, she's certainly entitled to say what she wishes, and it has obviously become embroiled in U.S. domestic politics. So uh, she has and of enemies, particularly on the right wing side of Congress, that would like to use any excuse to um, remove her from office, and, and a few of them are trying to do that. So it's become embroiled in American domestic politics, which I think is a bit unfortunate. Oh, okay. Um, but the U.S. position is not yet known. It depends on administration that. Uh, the, the current administration uh, definitely, as you said, is uh, one Somalia policy, but we don't no, know next. No, the, the administration has been very clear, and, and even in, in uh, the last couple of weeks, that the uh, U.S. government recognizes a unified Somalia. Uh, end of story. And, and it has not varied from that. So uh, that continues to be, as I understand it, the U.S. position. Uh, let me underscore, I don't speak for the U.S. government. I speak only for my U.S. self. I've been out of government now for 24 years, and uh, essentially in a different career as an academic. Okay, shifting gears, uh, let's discuss the halt of the ethio Eritrean rapprochement and its subsequent outcomes. Uh, considering your role as the U.S. ambassador to Ethiopia during the uh, ethio Eritrea war, can you provide us an honest assessment of this situation? As between Ethiopia and Eritrea? Yeah. Well, I can provide my own views on it. Yeah. Uh, sure. Whether, we, what, we're still in the dark. I mean, everybody, both sides just... Mm. I'm not sure that uh, certainly not all Ethiopians and certainly not all Eritreans agree with me, but... Um, I think you have a, a situation in, in the Horn of Africa since the EPRDF took power in 1991, where there's been sort of a, um, a shadow dance going on between uh, Isaiah Saporti and Eritrea on the one hand, and Mela Zanawi and then successive uh, Ethiopian leaders on the other, is to sort of who is, who is the major player in uh, in the Horn of Africa, and particularly as concerns Ethiopia and Eritrea. 
I think Isaiah Savorki has uh, seen himself in that role. And I think the various uh, Ethiopian leaders uh, since uh, the EPRDF took control have seen themselves and Ethiopia is in the uh, is the major player in the Horn of Africa. Uh, this has led to, um, I think, ongoing tension between Ethiopia and Eritrea, literally dating back to the mid 1990s, if not earlier. And when I was beginning to see some of this uh, in the late 1990s when I was serving in Ethiopia and of course saw it in, in, uh, in a major way with the outbreak of war between Ethiopia and Eritrea in 1998. But there were, there were signs of it uh, developing well before 1998. So you then had a situation of outright war for two years. Uh, then you had sort of a cold war going on from 2000 until uh, you had the, uh, the reconciliation between the Abi uh, Ahmed government and, uh, and the government in uh, Asmara, uh, which ultimately resulted in an actual um, uh, security link up in order to defeat uh, the Tigrayan People's Liberation Movement in Tigray region, uh, whereby the Eritreans were apparently invited into uh, Ethiopia to assist the federal government in Addis Ababa to defeat the Tigrayans. Uh, that uh, developed into a, a, a close relationship between Abiy Ahmed and, and Isaiah Safwerki, but then after the Pretoria Agreement and the end of conflict in Tigray uh, between the federal government and the, uh, and the Tigrayan government, yeah, I think you started to have a bit of a falling out again. Uh, that was followed more, most recently by this past summer by Abiy Ahmed's um, uh, statement that he would like to have a, a port uh, somewhere on the Red Sea. And it was, I think, understood by the Eritreans that that meant trying to ba take back territory uh, somewhere on the Eritrean coast. Uh, that set the whole relationship off on a different pattern again. So you, you have a situation today where the relations do not seem to be very good. Uh, I, I'm i not party to anything that uh, is said, but um, that would seem to be the case. Uh, at the beginning, you said there is a kind of competition between the two who performs well, uh, who is performing well. Is that like in relation with the United States to be the best friend with U.S. or is it, what is it? I mean, who is more powerful or what is that competition about? No, I think the competition is, is very different than, than anything involving the U.S. or any um, any non-Horn of African country for that matter. I think it's it's competition for who is, um, who is most important in the Horn of Africa. Is it Eritrea or is it Ethiopia? Uh, I mean, e Eritrea is a, a relatively small country, and both in terms of geography and in terms of population, uh, Ethiopia is a very large country and the second um, most uh, populous country on the entire continent uh, with a much bigger economy than you have in Eritrea. But Eritrea has a very important coastline. And of course, Ethiopia is landlocked. In fact, it's the most populous landlocked country in the world. Uh, ideally, that's not something you want to be. But nevertheless, there has been this ongoing competition, I think, at the leadership level between Eritrea and Ethiopia. Uh, Eritrea has had the advantage in that it has the same leader since independence, <clears throat> uh, legal independence in 1993. Ethiopia has had a series of different leaders. Uh, so that gives Isaiah something of an advantage in terms of the same personality being in charge. But I think there is ongoing competition between the two. Okay. Um, on the global stage, how would you evaluate Ethiopia's decision to join BRICS and its potential impact on the Ethiopian-U.S. relationship? Uh, I think Ethiopia, <laughs> the government, perceives it as a major coup to be included in, in that group. And perhaps it is. It certainly is a propaganda uh, coup, if you will, or, or advantage. Uh, it gives uh, Ethiopia additional status uh, with some major countries in the world. 
Uh, it perhaps opens the door to some new financing through the BRICS Development Bank. Uh, what's not clear to me is what Ethiopia pays into it. If you are part of BRICS, you're also supposed to, supposed to contribute something. And it's not clear to me what Ethiopia will be contributing. I don't think it has the finances to contribute anything today. Its uh, financial situation is, um, is very fraught at the moment. Uh, so if, if Ethiopia is expected to make contributions to the BRICS Development Bank, for example, I'm not sure I see that happening. Uh, for the short term, I'm not sure that Ethiopia is going to get much out of it other than being a propaganda victory, saying that it is now a, a member of the BRICS, and I guess that's a good thing. Um, but uh, in terms of tangible benefits, uh, it remains to be seen what it's going to get, if anything, from the BRICS Development Bank. And beyond that, BRICS doesn't really offer much. Uh, BRICS just doesn't have that much uh, involved with it at the moment, other than the bank uh, and, the, and the, 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 the simply the visibility of being a member of this organization. But it's kind of a strange organization when you look at it, when you have countries in it now that have a lot of disagreements. Uh, you have India and uh, China, <clears throat> China disagreeing over their boundary. You have uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran who have accommodated themselves diplomatically but still have differences. You have Egypt and Ethiopia who have differences over the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. Um, you, you, it's a very strange grouping of countries. Let me leave it at that. I see. Um... Delving into historical context, uh, what is your perspective on the late Paul Hens's letter to the late Prime Minister Malas Denawi, considering uh, Hens's background as a former journalist and CIA operative? How do you interpret its significance and potential impact on diplomatic relations or regional dynamics? Yeah, you know, it's an interesting letter, and frankly, I was not aware of it until you brought it to my attention over this past week. I have read it. Uh, I I know I knew Paul Hanzi, he was a friend of mine. Of course, I knew uh, Mel Zanawi as a result of my time in, in Addis Ababa, so I know both of the, of the players here. It is important, I think, again, to put everything in context. We're talking about a, a 1992 letter uh, the EPRDF has only been around for uh, one year, a little over one year at that point. Uh, the letter is well over 30 years old. And we're talking about two persons involved in the exchange, uh, both of whom are deceased now. Paul Henze died in, uh, in 2011, and of course, Melis and Awi died in 2012. So we're, we're cl clearly talking about history, not something that is uh, an active issue today. What was interesting to me about the letter is the degree to which Paul Henze was uh, uh, advising on the Irma Liberation Front and how unhappy he was with the role of the OLF back in 1992. That comes across very strongly uh, and the advice that he was giving to Mellis at that time. Now, I have no idea whether Mellis was accepting any of that advice, uh, one would have to know uh, from Mellis himself whether he agreed or disagreed with what Paul Henze was saying. But I, I see it more as an, a letter of historical interest and that is not particularly relevant to what's going on today. I know, but by, uh, by then, um, what's your remark? I mean, on your part, um, looking at the content, I, for example, uh, um, some of the things, some of historical things, like where he mentioned Oromo's or late commerce to Ethiopia is for us, uh, for me, I regard that as a distorted history. Uh, that's there in Ethiopian history, like uh, mostly in Ethiopian history, uh, uh, they taught us that Oromo's are uh, late commerce, like, 
moved to this uh, to current Ethiopia. When I was in grade nine, I was taught that due to the conflict between Ishak and Darod, and Somalia, they almost moved up. And some say they came over to from Madagascar, and some, I mean, uh, almost are Kushtik, and there are a lot of Kushtik groups in Ethiopia, Sidama, there, Hadiya, Kambata, Afar, Somalia. They, no, they say no other Kushtik group came from other place, but the Oromos came from somewhere else. And like, it's, you see the bias, but uh, the, I see uh, some kind of prejudice, uh, which he maybe accepted, uh, maybe distorted history. And um, how about other contents, like um, the way he, I, I, I see also some, some, um uh, something there are some tangible i mean like uh, some how he reached on conclusion on some issues it makes sense but how do you assess well from an historical point of view what would be most useful of course would be to know how Melis reacted to the letter we don't i don't know that and i don't think anyone well Maybe somebody knows it who's still alive, but there, as far as I know, there's no recorded reaction uh, by Mellis to the letter. So we don't know what his, his response was or what his reaction was. Keep in mind that at that time, Paul Henze was with the Rand Corporation. He had left government. He was no longer with the CIA, so he had no government function. Uh, he was speaking essentially as a private American, albeit one who had a, a good relationship with Mellis. So he was able to, to get in to see Mellis whenever he visited um, Ethiopia, as he did uh, or every two or three years uh, after the EPRDF came into power. But uh, we, since we don't know what, what Mellis's reaction was, uh, we don't know what impact the letter had, if any, and it may not. It may have had an impact. It may not have had a letter. It does tell us a lot about uh, Paul Henze's position, but Paul Henze is only speaking as uh, one private American citizen at that point in time, and um, as a result, is not really in that strong of a position to influence policy in Ethiopia. Yeah. Um, um... Uh, it's okay, but um, I, I know it's I, I, it's not the U.S. government's view, or it depends. It could be, it could not be, but what is written on there is Paul Hens's personal view. We can say that. Um, um, what are your overall thoughts of the Oromo struggle for self-determination? How do you perceive the views of the American political establishments, including uh, including CIA operatives regarding this matter? I mean, U.S. policy regarding this um, question of self-determination and. Well, if, if by if by self determination your your definition is an independent or a kind of yeah, uh, I'll be very frank with you. I I, I this idea of breaking up of the country into different parts. Uh, I would like to see the rights of uh, all Oromo and all other ethnic groups in that uh, uh, in, in that sense taken into account in Ethiopia. But I think once you start breaking up the country into an independent Oromia, then you, basically it's going to be the unraveling of, of uh, all of Ethiopia into a variety of different parts. And I've long argued uh, against that. I've argued in favor of, of trying to maintain a unified Ethiopia, but with being um, certain to try to make uh, all different ethnic groups uh, operate on equal footing in the country, which I admit is very hard to do, and it has not been achieved so far. Uh, but I don't, I just don't see the answer as being a, a breakup of the country into different pieces. And I know a lot of Oromo disagree with me on that. And I've had these discussions uh, with a lot of Oromo over the years. But I, I, 
it's just my belief, uh, and I'm, I speak as an American, obviously, not as an Ethiopian. I have no, uh, I have no uh, uh, right to uh, to get involved one way or the other in it. It's not my country, but that is. You ask my view on it, and that is my view that a unified Ethiopia is a a better result with uh, giving more rights to all ethnic groups than to break it up into a a variety of independent countries, most of which, if they were to become independent countries, would be economically non-viable, uh, or be as large enough where it probably could be an economically viable country, even a landlocked one. But the other pieces would probably not be economically viable. Uh, so what options, for example, what kind of government structure do you advise for Ethiopia? Currently, there is this constitutionally made uh, ethno-linguistic uh, kind of federalism in place. Uh, do, you, do you have in mind, something in mind, like? How well, it, it, it clearly has to be some kind of a federal system. Um, Nellis and I, we tried ethnic federalism and, and that hasn't worked out terribly well. There have been elements of it that I think have, have been positive, but um, it obviously has presented other kinds of problems. You have some groups in Ethiopia that don't like the idea of a federal system, uh, but I think in the final analysis, you, you have got to give um, a fair number of rights uh, and, and uh, authority to different, um, different parts of the country. One of the problems with, with ethnic federalism is the boundaries are always messy. Uh, there's a, an enormous uh, part of the population that does not live in the ethnic, among the ethnic group of which it is a part. It might live in some other part of the country. So those are issues that are very difficult to deal with. But other than the, the idea of coming up with a more fair a federal system, I'm not sure I have any great thoughts on how to resolve these kinds of problems. Okay. Um, so, recognizing the Ethiopian diaspora's uh, significant presence around maybe around 1 million in North America, what constructive role do you suggest uh, we can play in fostering unity? understanding, <coughs> uh, dialogue uh, amidst uh, current challenges. Uh, definitely, we are not better than people who are back home in the sense that sometimes you see the diaspora is more uh, radical and provoking conflict. So how, what's your advice? Well, there, there are several things. Um some of which are already being done by the diaspora, which I think are important. One is uh, increasingly elements of the diaspora in North America are, are fairly wealthy. I mean, they actually have uh, expendable income. And I think to the extent that they're willing to invest uh, in Ethiopia in some fashion, um, I think that can make a very positive contribution. And a surprising number of members of the diaspora are doing that today. Uh, that means you have to have faith in the country and in the way it is headed uh, before you're going to invest in it. And that may be a problem for some people in the diaspora. But I think investment uh, in Ethiopia is one way to do it. There are other groups that get involved on what I would call a more humanitarian basis, like uh, the People to People organization, which is mainly uh, a grouping of, um, of medical personnel who have made a lot of contributions in the medical field uh, to uh, Ethiopia. Those have been very positive. Now, they've also gotten involved, uh, in my view, in more politics than is helpful, but uh, I don't know how you avoid that. Um, in any event, to the extent that, that Ethiopians in the diaspora are willing to give their time and sometimes donate some of their money to good humanitarian activities in Ethiopia, that's all positive. I think on the on the political side, it's harder and harder for the diaspora to play a useful role. I know that historically, they have contributed to various 
political campaigns in the country. Uh, I don't know on the final analysis whether that has been all that helpful or not. Um, it, it really depends upon the individual organization that's being supported and whether that organization is trying to be play a positive role in the country or not. Some are, some are not. Uh, the one thing that I, I really hate to see from the diaspora is this outbreak of hate speech, uh, which I see all too frequently in the diaspora. And that has to come to an end. Uh, I don't care who it's aimed at. It serves absolutely no useful purpose. And if, if the diaspora could at least agree to abandon the concept of hate speech aimed at anybody, uh, that would be very positive because it, it does nothing useful whatsoever except maybe make somebody feel better when they utter hate speech, uh, but it, it simply contributes to the problem. Um, those would be the, the primary things that I would, would focus on. Um, and it, those are not really political issues. The the, avoiding hate speech is a political issue. Uh, the others are more economically focused. Okay. Um, and lastly, can you provide your insights on the potential for peace deal between the government of Ethiopia and the rebel groups like uh, OLA and FANO? Uh, how would you assess the challenges and opportunities in achieving resolution within the current context? I mean, just uh, your. Uh, your well, the challenge the challenges are clearly huge uh, i i commend the effort uh, by the government and the uh, the ola to meet i believe they met in zanzibar uh, to try to resolve differences it appears that so far that has not accomplished much and maybe uh, maybe has even ended i'm not quite sure where those discussions are at the moment uh, but at least the effort to meet was a uh, a positive development and I encourage that kind of effort uh, with all of these different groups. I don't know whether there has been a similar effort with FANO or not. Uh, if there has, I'm not aware of it, but it's very possible that there are, have been negotiations or have been discussions in Ethiopia with, with the different FANO groups. Uh, they seem to be more diversified than uh, the OLA is and maybe harder to, to meet with them or to get together with them in any in any meaningful way. But to the extent that there can be discussion that normally is a positive thing, I strongly would encourage it. Uh, it certainly beats the idea of, uh, of being uh, in conflict with one another. And if you can avoid the conflict and can avoid more deaths, that's a positive uh, development. But these are very, very hard things to do. And I think Ethiopians have a long way to go before they're willing to sit down and make meaningful compromise. And all of my experience with Ethiopia, which goes back to the, uh, the 1960s off and on, has been Ethiopians are not good at compromise. I heard you saying the, the same thing uh, on other media. Mm -hmm. uh, and I agree actually and uh, from a, your experience with regard to the deal between government and rebel groups this is not uh unique to ethiopia i mean it's uh thousands of i mean probably we're, there are conflicts uh, rebels anywhere in the world uh in many places uh we know Tamil Tiger in Sri Lanka, finally, I think uh, they did uh, some uh, deal with the government. We know in Colombia there are FARC and whatever. It happens, like uh, they deal with the government and uh, sometimes they resolve. So what, what are the major things, like very common things they agree on. I mean, what does the government give and what does the rebel groups give? Because in Ethiopia, we don't have that, that experience. Always one group wins, you either lose 100% or you gain 100%. 
This is the TPLF uh, Ethiopian government. Uh, Pretoria resolution is the first one, maybe in Ethiopian modern Ethiopian history. You either like the Derg lost and left, and the, the other group came to power, and that, that's all. I mean, we don't have that experience. So, if you share your experience of such kind of deals. Well, the first thing that has to happen is to move away from the concept of winner takes all, that you're either 100% against me or 100% for me sort of attitude. And the sooner that Ethiopians can, can pull themselves back from that concept, the easier it's going to be to, uh, to deal with the issue that you raise. It's a question of sharing essentially two things, sharing political power and sharing economic resources. And if you can somehow agree upon a formula to share both political power and economic resources in a more or less fair division, I think you will go a long way to resolving these, uh, this issue. Uh, but that's been very hard for Ethiopians to do. And uh, I, you know, I, don't, I think they're a long way yet from achieving that. Uh, it, it, it may take just a lot more time to get there, unfortunately. But that's effectively what has to happen. Uh, that's how I think successful democratic societies operate. Otherwise, you end up having a totalitarian dictatorship where everything is, is simply determined from on high. And if you don't agree with it, uh, they take you out in the backyard and shoot you. Uh, that's obviously not a solution that Americans want to see. And, and I hope it's not one that Ethiopians want to see. Yeah, why I raise this question is some people feel like uh, a rebel group can just uh, reach a resolution with the government without uh, this disarming and demobilization and DDR. Uh, mostly, I think that's, is there any scenario uh, government and rebel group can agree without uh, potential DDR resolution number one? and. Number two, with the power sharing, is it um, what kind of power do they share in most cases? Uh, executive power, right? Do they again uh, dissolve maybe uh, elected parliament? And oh, what is your experience? Because I know this has become a deadlock uh, in a, uh, from what we hear. Well, the whole concept of federalism is is part of power sharing and. This gets back to what kind of, of federalism you have in order to make it work. And obviously, uh, Ethiopia has not yet come upon the right recipe for that. Uh, but if, if you have, uh, if you can figure out a federalism that actually works, uh, a lot of this will solve itself in terms of distribution of resources and by providing enough power to the regions allowing them to decide uh, on their own how they want to pursue life. Uh, I think that is the answer. The, the question is, what kind of federalism do you develop? Uh, do you do it on the basis of regions rather than ethnic groups? Uh, is it, are, the, are the boundaries rather arbitrary? I mean, there are all different ways to do this, and I don't know what the best one is for Ethiopia, but I, I do think that federalism it goes a long way to dealing with the issue. Uh, you also have a national parliament, you have a national government. There has to be power sharing at that level too. Uh, but there has to be a willingness uh, by all sides, uh, those who oppose the central government and those who are running the central government, uh, to do this sharing. And if there's no willingness to share, then it's not going to work. All right. Uh, I have one question from our audience. Um... He said, um, can the diaspora declare a war on a country they migrated from? Uh, do they have the right to terrorize citizens of, or whatever? Uh, I mean, sometimes we see speeches of that inside conflict from the diaspora, um, including like, kill Mr. X, Mr. Y, or the leader, or whatever. And, uh, I mean, they do a lot of things, and I, I, I know one act called the uh, Neutrality Act. I don't know if that applies to citizens or only a government uh, in the US. I, I heard about, yeah, I read about Neutrality Act. Um, 
what are the obligations and duties of the diaspora in this regard? Um, what are the U.S. law law say? Uh, what do you know as a diplomat? I'm I'm not sure I totally understand the question. Can you can you rephrase it uh, in a in a in a very simple form or actually what he said is can a diaspora uh, does a diaspora have a right to declare a war on a country? I think it's are they allowed to make like inciting uh, conflict? Maybe they some diaspora you know arm the some rebel group you know they fund and I think that's what he mean. Um, yes. Okay. No, I, I think I understand where that where that question is headed. If if I were to answer that only from the American perspective, uh, what I think American law allows or does not allow, uh, there there would be serious legal repercussions if any part of the American diaspora from whatever country, uh, be it uh, you know Russian uh, diaspora or um, Ethiopian diaspora or Nigerian diaspora, doesn't make any difference. Uh, if any diaspora were to engage um, in some sort of effort to overthrow a, an established government anywhere else in the world, uh, that would be an illegal act uh, from the standpoint of the United States government. Uh, and I, I think that would create huge problems. So the, the basic answer to the, to the, I think the question is, no, a, a, a diaspora is not allowed in the United States to engage militarily or in support of trying to overthrow uh, an, another government, particularly one with which the United States has diplomatic relations. Okay. Um, yeah. So I would do. Um, given the current pre uh, precarious condition uh, in Ethiopia, what future scenarios do you foresee for the country? Uh, also, how can U.S. authorities contribute to steering the situation towards a more positive outcome in your perspective? Well, the one, the one area that, that the U.S. has been very active in for decades, not, not just recently, but for many decades, is providing a humanitarian assistance to Ethiopia. It's always been the first with the most. That still is true today, even though, though there was a brief interruption of delivery of food by USAID because of, of some corruption that was going on in the distribution of that food. Uh, that has now resumed in the country uh, and a lot of other humanitarian assistance in, in combating HIV AIDS, for example. The U.S. has made a huge contribution to that uh, and I'm sure will continue to do so in the future. So in, in the sense of, of humanitarian aid, uh, the U.S. has always been the biggest uh, contributor in uh, Ethiopia. The, uh, the other areas and the more difficult ones are in terms of um, uh, trying to, to deal with conflicts that involve Ethiopia in some fashion. The U.S. does these on a case-by-case on a -case basis. We currently have a, a special envoy for the Horn of Africa <clears throat> who is much engaged in uh, both Ethiopia and Sudan, for that matter, uh, and is trying to help out in terms of um, uh, dealing with the different uh, internal conflicts that are taking place in Ethiopia. I'm not privy to what he has accomplished or what contribution he has made so far, but at least the effort is there to try to help out in resolving some of these problems. Uh, the other thing the U.S. can do, and I would like to see us do more of, would be um, investment in countries like Ethiopia by private companies. We have not done nearly, nearly enough, and private companies, I think, recently have been uh, reluctant to go into Ethiopia because of the conflict in the country. Uh, investors <laughs> want to go to a place where they think they can make money, not to a place where they think there's going to be a lot of conflict. So this has held back, to some extent, uh, American 
uh, investment in the country. But potentially, it could play a very major and a very positive role. I mentioned earlier the role of uh, the diaspora uh, investing in Ethiopia. I don't know what the numbers are today. I, it may be that that too has slowed down because of conflict in the country. Uh, the diaspora doesn't want to invest in a place where it thinks it's going to lose money. Uh, so it, it may be a little more reluctant today to go in. But the whole idea of uh, foreign direct investment can be a critical element of development in a country. And I would like to see the U.S. do more of that in Ethiopia. Maybe one last question. Um, as you mentioned, uh, we have a problem of compromising our culture and there is this culture of also heroism and war and generally winning. Um, so pertaining to that, what do you think is a possible future? Um, what do you see uh, just as a neutral person? I'm sorry, the possible future of, of, of what? Of the Ethiopian uh, oh. situation. Oh, I must say I've, I've been um, more pessimistic of late than, than I have been in many, many years. And um, I still basically believe that the Ethiopian history is strong enough that it will somehow weather these current problems that it faces uh, because it does have this very lengthy background of of uh, generally sticking together. I mean, that doesn't mean that historically there have not also been serious uh, challenges to its unity, there have been, but it's, it's managed to survive them. And I think it can survive this too, but I have been more pessimistic than I've been in, in quite a long time. Um, and a lot of it does go back to this issue of not being willing to compromise and an element of that is is the degree of hate speech that I've seen involving um, Ethiopians. You don't see this much, at least I don't see this much hate speech in other equally troubled countries around the world. Uh, it seems to be a, a more common feature uh, among Ethiopians than it is among many other societies. I don't understand why. Maybe it's because there are things I don't understand about uh, Ethiopian psychology. <laughs> but this is very harmful, and it's simply got to stop. Um, and if it doesn't stop, then I will become even more pessimistic about the future of the country. Uh, but the idea of simply allowing meaningful discussions, hearing the other side's point of view, and being willing to accept a, a certain amount of compromise to the other person's point of view are, I think, the critical issues for uh, Ethiopia moving forward. Dear Ambassador, thank you for being with us today. My pleasure, and I wish you all the best. Thank you. Okay.